This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. I consider myself uh, incredibly lucky. Uh, the story goes from my mother. Uh, when I was a little kid, if you asked me, what did I want to be when I grew up? The story was, I want to be a tiger. <laughs> now, that went on for a while until I realized, no, I couldn't be a tiger, unfortunately. Then, uh, for some reason, I decided I wanted to be an oceanographer. And I was quite young, and I really wanted to be an oceanographer, and I was living in northern Canada, of all places. And uh, I managed to pursue this, and it's an absolute uh, dream of mine to come true to actually be here uh, at Scripps, which I think is certainly the most fantastic oceanographic institution in the world. Uh, and right now, we're very lucky to have a lab in the new uh, MISOM building across the street. Um, and we've, we're just surrounded by incredible people, uh, all dedicated to the ocean, and just stupendous scientists. It's a real pleasure being here at Scripps. Uh, not long after wanting to be a tiger, um, I, I started toting around a camera, believe it or not. I always liked taking pictures, even when I was a small child. When I became a, a graduate student at Scripps, uh, well, more than 25 years ago now, um, I, I was still pursuing photography. And I was very lucky to be able to use my experiences as a scientist and as a student here at Scripps to get into some unusual places and take pictures that other photographers were not easily able to get to. And, and there's just some pictures here where I have some, some of the endangered Guadalupe fur seals from San Benitos. We have you know, a beautiful coral reef in, in a very isolated part of the, the Pacific Ocean. And, and then even working from some spectacular ships that we have here at Scripps, like Flip. That allowed me to pursue photography and get a little bit known in the community. And as it turns out, San Diego is a very important sort of nucleating point for underwater photography and underwater cinematography uh, in North America. So I was able to interact with some, with some sort of heavy hitters in that community. And I sort of got known as that young guy who could do some strange diving, importantly didn't get very seasick, um, and, uh, and knew how to carry a camera. So, um, I started working on larger and larger projects. Uh, for instance, uh, I was fortunate to work on uh, BBC's Blue Planet that I think a lot of people have seen. Um, so on the left, that's, that's filming during Blue Planet that we did offshore here, uh, using rebreathers and staying in the water for, for long periods of time to see the pelagic organisms. And on the right is just uh, another shoot that we were doing in the mangrove swamps in the Bahamas. So um, sort of getting more experience traveling throughout the world. I had been working in polar environments, um, starting as a student, and my experience in the Antarctic led to me to work on a PBS nature documentary called Under Antarctic Ice. And this turned out to be the first digital high definition film that PBS Nature ever did, and, and it was well received. And, and here we see a, a shot of a diver um, working underneath the ice, and he's photographing and collecting in this, in this sort of magical benthic anchor ice zone just beneath the sea surface. Well, it's a frozen sea surface, of course. And you can see him in all these sort of twinkling and, and magical ice crystals that form along the bottom. And not only did we film and study and, and make a documentary about life underneath the ice, we also you know, followed some of the more iconic uh, Antarctic, Antarctic organisms like the emperor penguins that live above the ice. A little more recently, um, I've teamed up and have spent most of my sort of filmmaking time working on a series of IMAX documentaries now. And the very first one I worked on was called uh, Wild Ocean. And this was the first digital 3D IMAX production. And on the right, you can see uh, this very first digital IMAX system, um, it was in two pieces. Each piece weighed about 250 pounds. 
And uh, it took about three of us to sort of manhandle this, this equipment. And, but with it, we could, uh, we could shoot about eight minutes at a time in the water, uh, which doesn't sound like very much, but it's actually an eternity uh, when you're trying to capture sort of uh, short periods of interesting animal interaction. And it's, a really, it's a, an incredible long time when you think that an IMAX film camera holds less than a two minute load. So we were able to get into an environment and do some shooting that you, it's just totally impossible to do with a film camera. And this first uh, feature documentary was about uh, essentially the plight of marine fisheries in the ocean. And it concentrated on this rather remarkable migration of sardines along the eastern coast of southern Africa. And every year there's a large migration of, of, of spawning sardines and they travel north along the coast. And as they travel, they are feasted upon by all sorts of different predators. There's gannets, there's whales, there's dolphins, there's sharks. And we traveled along the coast and we filmed this. Turns out it was actually one of the sharkiest places we've ever worked. Um, uh, sections along the Trans Sky and Natal in South Africa were just, uh, they were, it was kind of thick with sharks at times. So it was, it could get exciting because the water was murky. But it was a very good experience and, and we formed a powerful team. And we continued on and, and our next film with the experience that we learned with this sort of clunky two-part system, a, a new IMAX 3D camera system was designed and you can see it here. Uh, this new system is anything but small. Um, it's, it still weighs 450 pounds out of the water. But um, this gives us almost a half hour of shooting, which is uh, just amazing. And it actually, this one camera system lets us film anything from the size of sort of the head of a shrimp all the way up to a whale shark. And we did a film called The Last Reef. And The Last Reef, as you can tell by the title, sort of followed the plight of coral reefs around the world uh, in this age of, of climate change and of ocean acidification. And we filmed this uh, in Micronesia, in the Atlantic and the North Pacific as well. Um, and on the left you can see, this is just a shot. We did some filming inside the famous Meromictic Lake in Palau that has all the non-stinging jellyfish. And then on the right you can see um, we can also shoot very small things. And these are just some, some, uh, some clownfish and an anemone. After these initial films, the producers said, well, that was, that was really great. Um, but we also would like to make some money. Um, <laughs> so let's do another documentary film. But let's, let's make it really appeal to audiences, so let's do sharks. And if we're going to do sharks, let's do white sharks. Uh, and we shot in here in California, in Mexico, in South Africa, and in New Zealand. And uh, it was a, a very great experience working and, and filming these sort of iconic apex predators, uh, as well as their, their prey and, and the environments and the cold water environments in which they live. Returning to the tropics, uh, the next IMAX film we uh, turned the giant camera loose on was, uh, it's called Journey to the South Pacific. Again, looking at not just the coral reefs, but really the communities that are involved, the, the indigenous peoples uh, of the South Pacific. Uh, we filmed exclusively in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. And we were looking at, uh, again, not just these very lush, very diverse reefs. It's in the Coral Triangle, so these are among the most uh, species diverse and lush coral reefs on the planet. Uh, but as well as how the villagers, how the, the culture uh, living in that part of the world uh, is coping with changes in their environment, um, their changes in fishing practices. This, the shot on the right is showing uh, their tuna fishing fleet, and they're trying more sustainable approaches to, to catching these large fish. Um, that shows them fishing there at sunrise. We've had, I think, a pretty good, a pretty good success with these environmental films. Um, at the same time, um, I was also working on some other projects, and this is in the Arctic. Uh, believe it or not, I, I ended up doing some shooting underwater for ice road truckers. So this isn't about the plight of anything. It's about <laughs> ice road truckers. And <laughs> I hadn't even seen this. I'm, I'm sure some people have seen it. It was, I guess, very popular. Um, <laughs> but anyway, 
uh, ice road truckers. And it's also funny, people say, oh, I heard you've worked on some films, and what have you done? And I'll talk about the Antarctic or whatever, and then they'll go, oh, but you worked on ice road truckers? That's the most amazing thing. <laughs> okay, so um, now as a scientist, we often take pictures. And uh, a lot of the work that I do as a scientist does involve imagery because, because of my background and because I enjoy taking pictures. And a scientist, we can use a camera as a very simple tool. Um, on the upper left, that is a shot of the sort of soft bottom community that you can see underneath the ice in the Antarctic. Um, you see you know, clusters of these uh, orange sea stars, and we have some squishy looking Nemertian worms, and we have a soft coral. Uh, and there's also some fragments of clams and whatnot. So pictures, of like, pictures just like this help ecologists uh, make a census of the environment. You know, you can count organisms, you can size organisms. It's a very, a very powerful tool. Um, it's a lot easier sometimes to take a picture and then do all that annoying counting and whatnot topside rather than down underneath the water where it's cold. On the right is another picture from the Antarctic. Now instead of looking at the sea floor, we're looking at the ice ceiling. And that is, it's a diatomaceous film. It's an algae that lives and grows in the cracks in the ice and underneath the, sea, underneath the ice surface. And as summer progresses, this uh, algae film grows thicker and thicker and thicker, and it finally starts to rain down upon the seafloor. And it turns out it feeds. It helps move carbon from the atmosphere through the sea ice, through photosynthesis, and then it gets eaten by the benthic community. And by taking pictures like the one on the right, we can go in and we can measure the, the intensity and the density of these stripes of, of color. And we can tell you, by comparing it to samples that we've already taken, we can tell you how much algae is there in that picture. We can tell you, you know, there are X number of grams of, of, of carbon that are going to rain to the sea floor from that one square meter. On the lower left is another just census type picture. That's a picture of a Caribbean coral reef, unfortunately looking a little beat up. But you see some hard corals there and we can go in and we can count them and we can measure them. And on the right is the very same scene, but it's taken with a fluorescent camera. So now we can see that certain corals glow in certain ways. And it turns out, people have figured out that looking at the amount of glow, that fluorescence that you see, can give you an idea of the health of the corals. So people can use pictures like that to tell you a little bit about the status of the reef. I'd like to talk a little bit about, about how we take pictures and, and, and what it all means. The very simplest camera is a pinhole camera. And I'm sure people might have done that as a science project. And, and actually, some people use them as photographic tools still, uh, pinhole cameras. Um, the concept is based on, you might have heard of a camera obscura. Um, that concept of projecting an image through a very small hole um, actually goes back to about 300 BC. It's a very old, old technique, but it wasn't until actually the late 1600s until we had a way of actually recording the image onto something, which was you know, the very first very simple films based on, based on some chemistry. So you can take a box and you can punch a hole in this box and you can project an image through the pinhole onto the box. And then if you put some film in the way, well, you can make a recording of that image. Turns out there's, there's actually animals that do the very same thing. On the right is a, is a picture of a, of, a, of a chambered nautilus that I took in, in deep water off Palau. And they're a very primitive creature. And its eye is actually a pinhole camera. It functions just like a pinhole camera. And you can see that that white sort of heart-shaped circular section. And you can see its pinhole sort of pupil. It looks like it's crying. It has like a, a stain dripping down. But that functions exactly like a pinhole camera. Light enters that very small hole. And then on the box-like inner surface, there are sensory cells, and it forms an image. So that's, that's a, just a very primitive organism that works as a pinhole camera. Now, a fancier camera really isn't that much different than a pinhole camera. And instead of just having a pinhole, well, what we do is we gather a lot more light, and we make a much sharper image by using a lens. So now, instead of having the light pass through a little hole, it passes through a lens, and we form a much cleaner, sharper image uh, 
inside the camera body against some sort of sensor. And there's usually a diaphragm and some other things in the, in the lens to, to help you manipulate the light that's coming into the camera. Well, it turns out that really that's how our eyes work, um, whether it's a, a human eye or, or the eye of my, my dog in the center. Um, our eye has a lens. Light passes through the lens and focuses through an iris, through our pupil, which changes shape to let uh, different amounts of light inside. And rather than projecting onto a, a photographic sensor, it, it projects onto the retina. So we have light-sensitive cells that then transmit this information into our brain and we form an image. So um, it, it, we're all cameras, really. There, there's another type of uh, uh, eye in the animal kingdom that's worth talking about, and that, that's a compound eye. And you're familiar with this with, um, with, with a fly's eye. Um, and also, many invertebrates in the ocean have a compound eye, including this, this fantastic animal. This is a mantis shrimp. Um, you can see a red one here on the left and, and, a, and a, another pretty colored one here on the right. Um, they're fantastic predators. Um, and they use their very, very keen eyesight to, to hunt. What's different about a compound eye compared to your eye is that instead of having just one lens that projects an image onto an array of sensors, each individual sensing cell has its own lens. That's why it's a compound eye. So you can almost see it on the right-hand picture. You know, it looks almost like a honeycomb grid on his eye. That's because it's made up of all these tiny little lenses that are focusing an image down on each individual cell inside its eye. Mantis shrimp are actually extra special because they can see, they have pigments in their sensor, sensor cells that are sensitive to light outside of the wavelengths of light that we're used to seeing. So they can see into the ultraviolet. They can see, I think, slightly into the infrared as well. So they actually have a much broader spectrum of vision than we do. It's also interesting, if you can tell where a mantis shrimp is looking, because when you're exactly on axis, you see a black spot, because you're essentially looking through the lenses right down into the blackness of the cell. So if you see the right-hand image, you see his two eyes. One of them is looking off up towards the top, and the other one is looking right at you guys. And you can see those two spots, and those are the cells inside his eye that are looking exactly at the audience right now. So you can form an image, and then we have to record the image. And at least until recently, we, we did that with film. And it's a chemical process. And in the center, you can see a roll of good old 35 millimeter film. On the left, beside it, is a little section of 70 millimeter IMAX film. That's what we, we shoot those other films with. But um, when was the last time people bought film? I mean, it's been quite a while now. Um, now, most of the cameras have a digital sensor. So instead of recording the light into chemicals embedded in some plastic, we record the light directly onto a silicon chip that converts the light into electrical impulses that we record on a memory stick or, or a hard drive or something like that. OK, so light. Most of the time we think about pictures, we think about the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And for us, the visible part of the spectrum goes from about 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers wavelength. So the light is coming out, and it's, we're thinking about light now as a wave rather than as a particle. And it has a wavelength in about that range. And that's what our eyes see as this various bands of color from the very shorter wavelengths as the blues to the longer wavelengths being red. And if you get outside those bands that we can't see, we call them infrared and ultraviolet. Well, the electromagnetic spectrum is enormous. We're just used to thinking about this little visible part. And if you look on the top, that's just a little tiny wedge of the electromagnetic spectrum. And when, as a scientist, when we make images, some of the tricks we play is we don't use visible light anymore. We use other wavelengths. And you can pick your wavelengths to tune your image, your science, your question to what you're trying to study. I mean, you're familiar this, with this with an x-ray. If you're trying to image inside the body while visible light doesn't penetrate, 
But very short wavelength objects like x-rays can penetrate and we can see our bones. So we can play these sorts of games. We do that in science to, to exploit the electromagnetic spectrum to image things that we're interested in. And I, I've just added a few little things on top. So really the electromagnetic spectrum is enormous. There's many orders of magnitude and scale here from subatomic sizes. You can see viruses at around, around 100 nanometers in size. And you have bacteria at around a micron and plankton and sharks at, at a couple of meters and, and so on. So the electromagnetic spectrum spans this enormous range of scales. I keep mentioning these, these tricks that we play. Well, this is a, a new trick that's, that's come. Uh, and it's based entirely on new computer technology. Now, if you go outside and, and you look up at the moon, most of the time it doesn't look very good. And the reason it doesn't look very good is that your eye is actually very good at making sense of distortions and rapid changes and whatnot. So when you look at the moon, you see this. When a camera looks at the moon, it usually sees something like this. And it's all wobbly. And it's all wobbly because what limits our ability to see things that are very far away and off the Earth are distortions in the atmosphere. So the upper atmosphere is actually wobbly and, 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 and very disruptive to the light that's, that's coming from the moon. So when we use a camera and we take just a snapshot of the moon, it's all distorted, except in a couple little places where it's in focus. If you look up sort of 3 quarters of the way up on the left, see it's kind of in focus there. This used to be only the, what the pros could do, you know, if you went to Palomar Observatory or Mauna Kea. What you do is you very rapidly take pictures of the moon, and then you use a computer to piece it all together. So all I do now is I, I don't use a regular still camera. I use a very fast video camera. And I take about 10 seconds of high-speed images of the, of the moon. Most of them look like this. But everywhere it's sharp, the computer automatically goes in and reconstructs it and puts it all back together for you, and you get a picture that's sharp. So that's how, that's how astronomers can get very, very crisp-looking pictures, even from the Earth. They also play some other games in which they sort of straighten out the image as it reaches their sensor. And they do that with a deformable lens or a deformable mirror. And they very quickly alter that mirror to make up for all the wobbles in the atmosphere. And that kind of thing is still very expensive. But one of these days, you know, even amateurs are going to be able to do the same thing, just like we can now do with computers. In fact, it works well enough that you can take pretty darn close-up pictures, and you can actually see some of the landing sites. For These are Apollo 11, 17, and 15. Now, if you take your same camera and you point it at the sun, this is what you get. In fact, don't anybody do this. Um, you do not, particularly, I can see some kids in the audience. Don't ever, ever, ever look at the sun with a camera or with the binoculars or with a telescope. You can blind yourself in a, in a microsecond. It's very dangerous. So don't ever look directly at the sun. But if you do, <laughs> this is what you're going to see. It's, you really can't see much. There's so much energy there. It's all sort of blown out. In fact, I've had to kind of tone it down a bit so you can tell that we're looking at the sun. But you can play some tricks. And you can take pictures like this. And what we're doing now is we're playing another trick. And we're playing a trick now with filtering. So we're altering the light that's reaching our sensor. Now, it turns out that there's a layer of the sun called the chromosphere. And the chromosphere is about 2,000 kilometers thick. And it's sort of just on the outer, outer surface of the sun. And it's, it gets extremely hot. And all this hot gas, it's, it's hot hydrogen gas, um, it ends up emitting a very narrow wavelength of light. And I'm, I'm going to explain this in a little more detail in a second. But if you just restrict the light reaching your camera to that one very narrow band, you can actually end up seeing detail on the sun's surface. And we can see uh, prominences, and we can see sunspots, and we can see all sorts of detail on the sun. And how this works is this. 
if you remember that first electromagnetic spectrum I showed you, it, I, I had it as a, a very smooth, colorful rainbow. Well, it turns out if you really look closely at what comes from the sun, the spectrum of the sun, it's not a smooth gradation at all. There's all these little lines, these little bands in there. It's sort of selective absorption in emission of different wavelengths of light. And that idea, this selective absorption and emission, is really the basis of what scientists call spectroscopy. So we can look at light that comes from things, whether it's a planet far away or the sun or a match, or we can burn something and we can look at the flame. We can study these little lines and these little bands and we can tell you what atoms are in there. And as a great example, at the bottom, this is, we call this the Bohr model of an atom. It's a very simple model of an atom and we're looking at a hydrogen atom. It has just the one proton in its nucleus and it has an electron that orbits around it. It's a very simple model, uh, but it'll do for our, my description here. It turns out when an electron moves around, it wants to stay in very specific orbits around its proton. So the hydrogen atom has its electron, it's moving around, and it's out, we'll call it in orbit number three. And every now and then, it jumps from orbit number three to orbit number two. And it can do that for various reasons. It can do it occasionally spontaneously, or it can do it when it absorbs a certain amount of energy. Now when it does that, and it jumps state, it actually emits a photon, so it zips out a little light particle, and that light particle comes out at a very, very, very specific wavelength. It turns out it comes out at exactly 656.281 nanometers. <laughs> Up above, you can see the big stripy section. The next spectrum down is the spectrum of a hydrogen atom. And you can see when you just look at the light that comes off of hydrogen, you've just got these bands here. And you can see the very bright one that's called the hydrogen alpha band, and that's the bright light you get at exactly 656.281 nanometers. So if I make a filter, we call it an etalon filter, that's extremely specific. We can tune it to exactly 656.281 nanometers, and we put it in front of our image from the sun. It blocks out all the light, all the light from the sun, except for what comes from that hydrogen atom and that electron jumping between state three and state two. And that's exactly what's going on in the chromosphere of the sun. It's full of hydrogen, it's extremely hot, and all those little electrons are jumping around and the ones that jump between orbit three and orbit two emit light at that exact wavelength. I filter out everything else and we can get a picture like this. And that's the transit of Venus from just a couple of years ago. So that's Venus passing in front of the sun. You can see a prominence on the side. And in fact, um, more powerful telescopes and fancy schmancy astronomers, they can go in and they can look at that little band of light around Venus itself and tell you about what's in its atmosphere. So that's why things like transits are very important to astronomers. So it's incredible what you can do with tools these days. This is something I did in my driveway. You know, it, this, is, this, is, this is incredible. A little bit more about fancy filtering. Um, this is, I'm sure some people recognize the constellation, it's Orion. You can see Orion's belt of three stars and his sword hanging down below. Now, if you lived in a place that was still dark and you opened up your camera, you might be able to get a picture like on the left. When you're here in San Diego and you look up and you look for Orion, you'd be lucky if you saw something like the picture on the right. So we don't really see any of these background stars. We really only see the bright stars. And it's because of light pollution. You know, we have a lot of background light from street lights, sky glow from the city itself. And it, it blocks our ability to see all, this, all the fainter stars in the sky. However, we can still play that same filtering trick. If you look in the sword of Orion, there's a bright spot. And you can see it a little easier, actually, in the light-polluted picture. Well, that's the Orion Nebula. 
It's about, I think it's about 1,300 light years away. It's still in the Milky Way galaxy, but it's one of the faintest things you can actually see with your naked eye. But you really don't see much detail. It's a spectacular, it's actually quite a large feature. But again, if you filter it correctly, you can get an image like the one on the right, and you can see all this color and all this detail. And what I've done here is I've played the same trick. I've taken a picture, but instead of just looking at the hydrogen alpha band, which you can see highlighted in the little graph on the left, you can see that hydrogen alpha mark at about 650 nanometers. I also took a picture with the sulfur two band, which is almost 700 nanometers. And I also took a picture with the oxygen three band. And I combine them all, and I can get the picture on the right. And the real reason I get the picture on the right is most of the sky glow comes from a certain band that I've labeled SL, which stands for street light. <laughs> and street lights are usually low sodium vapor lamps. And because it's sodium, and it's discharged in a certain way, it ends up actually putting out a fairly narrow, fairly narrow wavelength. And by picking these bands outside the band of street lights, we can sort of see through all that light pollution. So in 1876, on the Challenger expedition, very famous oceanographic expedition traveling around the world, they collected a little critter about a millimeter long, and they called it Pyrocystis fusiformis. And Pyrocystis fusiformis is a dinoflagellate plankton. There's a picture from a microscope on the upper right. And they call it Pyrocystis fusiformis. Fusiformis because it's long, fusiform, spindle-like. And they call it Pyrocystis because when you agitate it, it glows. So this is one of the bioluminescent plankton. And here we can see my colleague, Mike Latz. When you agitate this particular organism, it glows. There's a certain chemical reaction that goes on inside its cell, and it emits light. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. Um, we get similar glowing, uh, we get lingulodinium polydrum, which is another dinoflagellate here when we have the red tides that glow in the summertime. So very similar process, just a different bug. Actually, he'd get mad if I heard me calling him bugs, but I call them bugs. So there's Mike, it's glowing. And I don't usually study organisms like this. Most of the time, myself and my colleague who is going to speak to you tonight, we study bubbles in the ocean for, the, for a large part of our work. And we study the, the way they make sound, and we study the way they fragment, and we study the way they move gas between the ocean and the atmosphere when the, when the ocean overturns and waves break. And we were always stymied by, how can we study what's going on inside a breaking wave? It's opaque. It's turbulent. It's, you can't see inside there. And we started thinking, like, I need, if I had some special instrument, it would be very tiny, and I'd have a lot of them, and I'd be able to put them in the water, and it wouldn't disrupt the flow, but it would tell me what's going on. And I used to have an office next door to Mike, and I was going, wait a second, Mike has these little critters that glow when you, when you agitate them. I wonder if we can use these to study breaking waves. And we did. And we came up with a plan, and we ended up calibrating these, these critters. And it turns out that this species and some of the other species, they only light up when they experience a certain amount of shear force on their body. So we can go in and we can calibrate it then. So we did a series of experiments, and we calibrated how much oomph it took on their little cell bodies to make them light up. So then we had our sensors. And we can grow them by the gallon, you know? So here's our millions of sensors. So we, we did an experiment, and we cultured big vats of this plankton, and we seeded the large wave channel inside the hydraulics building, which is just across the street at Scripps. And this is a building where we, and, and a facility where we study breaking waves. And we seeded it all, and we worked at night, because they only flash at night. And we had some very special cameras that can essentially count individual photons they see in the dark. And we rigged them up on these big robot systems that could track down and sort of lock onto a wave you know, as it goes on, because it's a very fast process. And we, we set about to study what goes on inside, in, in, inside a breaking wave. And this is what you get. 
So we're going to watch a little video here. So that's a little movie as a camera is rocketing down a little robotic driven track and then filming all the glowing specks of plankton as they light up. And those were false colors that we added afterwards. It's all monochrome normally. You see it in black and white. So we add the color and the color actually turns out to give us a proxy for what the actual forces are inside the water. So we can end up doing science nerdy stuff like this. So we can have a picture of, of our wave moving and then we have our pixel intensities and we can run some calculations and we can tell you the exact shear stress over time as a wave is breaking. And this is something that's never been done before because nobody had the tool. So here we're using biology and cameras as a tool to study how waves break and the physics of the upper ocean. What was kind of funny is we usually come at this from an acoustic perspective. We do a lot of listening to this process. When you break a wave, you form bubbles. And when bubbles are formed, they ring like little bells. And each bubble rings like a little bell with a different tone. So we can listen to the tones, and we can tell you what bubbles are there. So not only are we looking at this, we're listening to it. So we have our big tank, and we have hydrophones and everything in place. And everybody heard about this cool experiment that was going on. So we'd had this like spectator gallery <laughs> inside here waiting. You know, okay, here comes, we could only do two or three waves a night because then we'd run out of plankton. And everybody would be waiting, and okay, here comes the plankton, you know, and here comes the wave, and it would go down, and everyone would be excited and whatnot. And, and we started looking at the data afterwards, and we'd, we were looking at the spectrums of the sound. As it's coming out, it's like, okay, well, here's the wave break, and what's this big noise? We, that wasn't in the tank. And it turns out when we listened to it with our ears, it was, ooh. So, so everybody was watching this, and we were recording everyone cheering every time a wave broke, because it would light up the tank, and it was spectacular. So then we had to have a rule that when we were doing this experiment, nobody was allowed to talk. <laughs> OK, so we've been studying bubbles and water drops and processes close to the sea surface. We also use some very high-speed cameras. In fact, we have some cameras that can run at 100,000 frames a second. So we can really, really sh slow things down. Bubble processes and water drops, the fine physics that goes on on very, very short time scales. So we need some special equipment. And on the left is a picture of a very tiny water drop landing back on the sea surface. And granted, I've taken it in a kind of a fancy schmancy, it looks pretty kind of way, so you can see the reflection and everything. But we can actually get information out of pictures like that. For instance, the picture on the right is, is this a similar water drop. But all I've done is change the temperature of the water. So the one on the left is in warm water, and the one on the right is in cold water. And when you have cold water, the water becomes more viscous. So it changes the way the, the drop and the bubble forms. You see it, it's, it's got a thicker rim. It's forming fewer of these, we call them ligatures, that break up afterwards. and, and shoot other droplets out compared to the one on the left. And then you can get fancy and then start playing with food coloring. <laughs> and for instance, the one on the left, I've actually dropped another tiny droplet that has green stuff in it onto another erupting jet from a previous one. And it's hit the jet. And then it's gone splat like a mushroom. And because it's a different viscosity, it forms that sort of solid cap. And the one on the right is just a little bit later, where another drop has rained back down and has fallen on top of the drop that's coming up from the first impact. And you get these sort of nifty glass-like looking uh, effects. And, and we're going to come back to the one on the right with the green juice in it. The science in our lab and my colleagues, we, we'd been studying processes that happen in the upper meter or two of the ocean. We're very interested in, in these activities, breaking waves, bubbles coming to the surface. And it was interesting in that our avenue of research was getting closer and closer to the interface between the atmosphere and the ocean.
we were getting more and more interested in what happens to the bubbles when they're on the surface as opposed to what was going on when they were deeper in the water. At the same time, there was a group of atmospheric chemists here at UCSD, and they were studying things in the atmosphere, and they were getting interested in, well, what's going on down at the sea surface? So they were going from above, and they started working down towards the sea surface and what was going on at that interface, and we were down below, and we were working our way up to what was going on at this interface, and we actually met in the middle, right on the interface, and we came together, and now we're studying things together, and the main project is spearheaded by a, a fantastic UCSD and Scripps scientist, Dr. Kim Prather. And it's under the auspices of CASE, which is the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Climate and the Environment. And there's a large team now of scientists very interested in what's going on between the ocean and the atmosphere. So we're part of this larger group. And we're very, at least from our lab's perspective, we're very interested still in what's going on in those oceanographic processes, but how they relate to what's going on now in the atmosphere. So, we're coming from a background, at least for me, of what's going on inside a breaking wave. And now we're interested in how that affects the, how that affects the atmosphere. And one of the first things we wanted to know was, well, where does the air go when a bubble breaks on the sea surface? You've captured some air, and it goes underneath, and it comes up again. Well, how, how on earth do you study that? It's, it's air, you know? <laughs> so turns out you, you can do that. On the right is, does anybody know what that is? That's the Fata Morgana. Have you heard of that? The Fata Morgana? It's, it's a mirage, famous mirage. And m most people are familiar maybe with mirages in the desert or that shimmer you get above a hot road in the summertime. Well, it's very famous in the Antarctic. You get that same shimmer and what you can see there those are the transantarctic islands in the background, I mean, the transantarctic mountains. And I'm looking across the sea ice, and that little low lump is an, uh, it's sort of an island that sticks up through the sea ice, way in the distance, it's many kilometers in the distance. And you can see there's an image of that island inverted up above it. It's not complete, but you can see it kind of bloops out again up top. And in fact, if you look, there's a whole band there that looks kind of weird, right? It's all kind of stretched out. Well, that's the mirage. And what's happening is you have a temperature inversion. So the temperature is actually slightly warmer there than it is up above and it is down below. And when light passes through air, and when it passes through air of different densities, because it's hotter or colder, it bends the light. So I was able to exploit that density shimmer to take a picture of something that's invisible. So down below, you can't see the bubble, but there was a tiny little bubble there about a millimeter in diameter. It was sort of sitting right in here, tiny little bubble. And what I did was I made the bubble with cold water. And then I set up a really fancy pile of mirrors and laser beams and all this stuff and did something called laser Schlieren photography. And what that does is let you image essentially the mirage of a density change. So you can just see a glow in those, that sequence of pictures and those are two hundredths of a second apart. So just on the left, the bubble has just broken and now it's ejected a puff of cold air up into the atmosphere that then sort of goes boop and shoots up. And that air has been previously mixed. There was like a water kind of went into the tank, mixed around, got cold, had sucked air from the atmosphere, went back down in and then went bloop and it shoots it up again. So that, that's what happens. And we're very interested in that kind of thing because that helps explain how particles get from the ocean up into the air. So now through CASE, we're, we're studying a lot of these little tiny things involved with very tiny aerosol particles. So aerosols, you know, some of them can be 50 nanometers in size up to a few tens of microns in size. So these are tiny things, and to, to look at them and to study them, we have to exploit some of those other tricks. And in this case, rather than imaging them with visible light, we're imaging them with electron beams. They have a much shorter wavelength, if you remember that first picture, 
then you've probably heard of the technique on the left. This is scanning electron microscopy. This is not a particle. That's actually a piece of a larvae. That was the only picture I had handy this afternoon. <laughs> but um, that, what we've done is we've scanned an electron beam very rapidly across the surface of a, of a larvae, and we can see very fiery fine detail structure, much smaller than you can see in visible light. That's just a few microns across. Now on the right is, instead of a scanning electron microscope, we're using a transmission electron microscope. So now we're shooting electrons through our target, and it makes us, it lets us look at things that are even smaller. And this is actually an even newer technique that was just developed here at CASE. It's called CryoTEM. And what we do now is we need to study things very rapidly. I was saying things happen on very fast time scales. Well, if you make a particle that's, you know, a micron in size, it actually changes chemical composition very quickly once it's created. For instance, they dry out incredibly fast. And we're interested in what's going on right at the moment of creation. So we want to know what's going on inside those particles when they're still wet. So to do that, we capture the particles, and we have them in a little machine, and we capture the particle, and then essentially immediately open a trap door, and they fall into a big vat of liquid nitrogen, and it freezes them instantly, and then we can take those frozen samples and put them into a, a transmission electron microscope. Then the trick is finding them again. I mean, you're talking in little tiny guys. And then we can see things like on the right, um, in fact, uh, it's hard to make sense of these, but uh, in the upper left, that green arrow is actually pointing to an entire bacterium that was caught inside one of these aerosols. The one down below, you can see the green arrow. It's actually pointing up at a virus. So these are things that we're, we're starting to explore how things are aerosolized, how we get from the ocean into the air. And to do that, we have to use these new techniques. In fact, if we want to go even smaller, we use a different technique and it's called atomic force microscopy. Now instead of actually imaging things directly, we're not really imaging at all, but we're still making a picture, and I'll explain how this works. In the center is just a cartoon of, of uh, how, a, how one of these machines operates. You have a sample, which is just, it's that green wiggly bit that shows the sample. And what we do is we have a very teeny tiny stylus. And we essentially move that teeny tiny stylus across the surface of the sample, and we watch that stylus wiggle. And we scan it back and forth, and we measure the wiggles. And we measure the wiggles by bouncing a little tiny laser beam off the surface and then detecting that. In fact, it's really just like a phonograph. Right? You're just scanning a needle on the phonograph, and we're taking a picture of all the little bumps and valleys. On the right is some output. I really want, I, I wanted to get you guys an, an AFM image of a phonograph, but I, I, I didn't have a record. <laughs> so the best I could do is an image of a CD-ROM. And all those little pits are the microscopic ones and zeros that the laser burns into the surface of a CD when you're going to listen to music. So rather than having a needle scratch along those bumps and valleys on your old records, your old vinyl 45s, we have a laser beam that bounces off those little pits and valleys in a CD-ROM, and we listen to the music. On the upper left is a picture of actually one of these things in, in operation. And you can see the stylus. You can't see the tip. The tip is extremely tiny. It's on the order of, oh, maybe 10 nanometers across. It's underneath that. But you can see the big laser beam bouncing off it right there. So that's, that's AFM. And this is the type of information we get out of it. So it's not really a true picture, but we end up building a picture from all these little wiggles. In fact, well, I'll, I'll tell you in a second, the one on the left that is essentially a topographic map of an aerosol particle that we've collected. And you can see it kind of, the color is just with height. You can see it's, it's less than two microns tall. But we've collected it, and it kind of went splat. You know, there's a high part, and then it looks like an egg yolk, and then the, the white part of the egg. 
Well, one of the tricks we do with an AFM is we don't actually touch the surface. We get very close to the surface and we wobble the tip at about 300 kilohertz. It wobbles very fast and a computer analyzes these wobbles and what those wobbles do is they interact with the molecular forces and whatnot in the atoms that form the particle. So we can look at changes in the wobbling. What we look at is the phase of the wobble. And that phase change ends up telling us something about the properties of this particle. And the picture on the right is the phase information now superimposed on the topography. And you can see not only is it high with a lump and then a, the egg white, you can see it's high with a lump and then the egg white, the part that went splat, is a totally different material. And what it really is is you can see it's dark blue. That is a salt crystal. That's probably uh, sodium. So sea salt that's come out, it's formed a tiny little crystal. And then the splat is an organic coating that came off of what was floating in the sea surface. So we can study incredibly tiny things with this type of imaging. Now I told you we were going to get back to the green juice. So here's the green juice again. And this is a very tiny bubble. And we want to know how do things get out of the ocean and into the atmosphere? And what sorts of things get out of the ocean into the atmosphere? It turns out it's very selective. Not everything gets out. Only some things do. And we still really don't understand the processes of what selects different particles. And it turns out, it sounds very esoteric, but it's actually very important because certain particles get out and they get into the atmosphere. And there's something very special about them. It's like one in a hundred, one in a thousand particles is very special. And it can turn out to be a seed for an ice particle. And when you get, we call them ice nucleating particles. When you get these ice nucleating particles in the atmosphere, that's what forms clouds. So these little particles go up, the special ones end up forming clouds and we get rain and we, you know, it impacts climate. So we wanna know what regulates this? How does this work? So I have my green juice, and it's actually very special green juice. When this, the one on the right doesn't have the green juice in it, but when a bubble like that pops, what it does is it forms a jet, and that jet bloops right up the center of the pop bubble, and it ejects something we call a jet drop, and you can see it shooting up there. Well, we wanted to know what the heck is inside that drop. Why is that drop perhaps different than the water that it came from? Why is the drop beside it different? So how are we going to look at that? Well, this is my green juice. And what I've done is we made a special green juice. And the green juice is a mixture of two different types of organism again. Again, we're using biology to, to for, perform some tricks for us. So the green comes from a bacteria called Vibrio harvii, and it's a common marine bacteria. You can culture it in the lab. It's, fact, it's related to Vibrio cholera, actually, and obviously we weren't playing with cholera, but we're playing with harvii. And the other great thing about Vibrio is that molecular biologists can go in and they've tweaked the molecular chemistry and the, the genome of Vibrio harvii and they've, you can ask them. I asked Farouk Azam, a great microbiologist here at Scripps, I said, do you have any Vibrio harvi with GFP? And GFP is the green fluorescent protein. So people have been able to figure out what proteins are required to make that glow, like a bioluminescent bug. And they've spliced it into the genome of Vibrio harvi. So now I've got a, I've got a, I, I'm going to call it a bug again. I've got a bacterium that's very tiny, it's a micron in size, and it glows when I hit it with a certain wavelength of light, it glows green. Now beside it is a slightly different critter. This is just a regular planktonic algae. It's a green algae, it's Denaliella. Now Denaliella is photosynthetic. That means it has chlorophyll in it, and if I hit chlorophyll with a certain wavelength of light, it glows red. So here's my bubble on the left. And now when I look at the bubble at the same time 
with these different wavelengths of light, we can see that the bacteria sit all at the top of the bubble, whereas the larger plankton all sit down below. So we're getting an idea of how these things happen in the ocean. We get size selective sorting, what's going on before these bubbles break. So the different parts of the uh, aerosol fraction that come from uh, different parts of the bubble end up having automatically, just through basic physics, different types of organisms embedded in them. Now this, this is one of the last pictures and I call this a fortuitous accident. This is a picture through a fluorescence microscope, not, a, not an outlandishly fancy microscope, but one that we can use that uh, we can very carefully select different wavelengths of light. And what we were doing is we were looking at just the top, we call it the, the surface microlayer, this top sort of fraction of a millimeter of the sea surface. We'd taken a sample of that water and we've stained it with special stains and we're looking at it through the microscope and what those colors are, they're lighting up different, uh, different proteins and different uh, fluorescent uh, molecules inside different organisms. The red dots that you see are actually related to a, uh, a photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, the green ones are a non-photosynthetic bacteria. The very, very, very tiny green flakes are viruses. Now, it was an accident because we made a mistake during the staining. And when I took it out, we'd ended up condensing tiny little droplets of seawater inside our slides. So what you see that looks like a sphere is about 200 microns across, and it is a tiny little blob of water. And inside that tiny drop, you can see it's acting like a lens now on all the stuff behind it, and we can very clearly see all these viruses, all the little bacteria of different types. And it ends up forming a cute little picture, a wonderful sort of microcosmic picture of what we see in the ocean. We have this wonderful mixture that gets ejected into the atmosphere. And why this is so important is, is this. Here's a picture of our, our ocean Earth. 71% of the Earth is covered by by water, very important for the whole world's ecosystems, whether they're on land or, at, or in the sea. Now, if everybody just stops and takes, take four breaths. So four breaths. Well, two of those four breaths are made up of oxygen that came directly from the sea. So that's half of what you breathe was generated by the ocean. One of those two breaths was formed by one single bacterium. It's Prochlorococcus. It's the most abundant thing on Earth. All over the ocean, that's producing half the oxygen that you breathe, and it's caught up in this incredible physical, biological, wonderful mechanism that's going on in the upper ocean. At the same time, a lot of that is ejected up into the atmosphere. And when it's there, it does just a little thing like essentially control the entire world's climate. <laughs> so that's what we're studying. And that's what I have for you tonight. Thank you for bringing a great audience. There's a whole pile of people that I've worked with over the years, whether they're scientists, all this is a fraction of the people that I work with, or the diving and the photographic community that I work with. And of course, I always have to thank everyone here at Scripps and at the aquarium and Cheryl and, and all my colleagues. So this truly is a wonderful place to be. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.